This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. A little bit of Christmas organ music to start off this Monday. It's beautiful. It's almost Christmas, Carol. Don't you love it when you get to say Christmas, Carol? Mm Mm-hmm. It's the best time of year for my name. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for tuning in to Deep South Dining. We are happy to be here on this Monday, the one right before Christmas. It's an exciting one. There are gifts all over the table, all outside. I don't even know where to start, except I will start by welcoming Chef Enrica Williams back to the show. Good morning, Chef. Good morning. Thank you for having me back. In herself. Oh, thank you. So exciting. (laughs) What you been up to? I mean, you're Um, so busy. Yeah, You're so everywhere. so I am on hiatus right now, taking a little bit of a break until the new year, and uh, I have a quite an ambitious project as Uh-oh. always. Uh, to, are you going to reveal it here on Deep South? Um, Time? at a later date. Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. All right. Okay. It's, it's, yeah. So you have to hold me to that, so right. I can come back right. to talk about it and visit with you guys. Hmm. Yeah. It's it's been restful um, <laughs> for <laughs> for a change. Um, enjoying the holidays as much as I can now because you know, as a chef or being in the hospitality industry, this is like the craziest time of the year yeah. to make other people have enjoyable holidays. So I'm getting to just relax in that. And it's a particularly weird time to be both in the hospitality mm-hmm. industry and dealing with the fourth wave of COVID. I mean, let's just yeah. talk about that complication. Yeah, yeah. It is It is. It is the ongoing uh, figuring out how to implement strategies and also just things that make people feel and understand that you are very cognizant of the fact of COVID. You're being clean, you're sanitizing, and also people still want to entertain and they want to gather. So you try to do that in the most safe way Mm -hmm. without losing the intimacy and the the togetherness that people are looking for. I had a really interesting first-time experience last night. I went to a dinner party. It was a small dinner party, but the host actually had the new home COVID test. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the way of the future. Mm -hmm. And and so each person that came in the door Mm -hmm. took the COVID test, and then we waited, you know, five minutes to you know to see and and she had a really good reason for uh you know wanting us to do that but i said yeah this is the wave of the future but what it did it just made the night just so much more relaxed yeah right well what would you do say if one of the guests tested positive positive ask them to to, they would yeah Mm -hmm. absolutely so the so the Self testing is is now the party favor uh, mm-hmm. and, and the icebreaker. It could right. be. No. I mean right. that 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 could be, but it was really uh, really easy. I mean they got it was a little card and you wrote your name. There were like eight people and you you did the uh-huh. test and well, you had mm-hmm. to set it there. So, so there you have it. Well, that's good. I mean that's one way to handle what is before us, right? So, Carol, you've been posting on cooking and coping. You've been doing both. So what what's what's cooking in your kitchen? Well, this weekend I did our cooking and coping family beef brisket mm. with cooked in Maker's Mark bourbon mm. and Guinness stout and other aromatics with a peach glaze. It's something that Rusty Burwell from Virginia and Bob Yarbrough, one of our posters from Virginia, mm. and now it's kind of become a regular you know, a regular thing. So that's how I spend it. Cooks for four and a half or four and a half hours. And that's what I did. Great. How about you? Well, I didn't do much cooking uh, except for scrambling eggs for grandchildren. But uh, Kara's been baking this wonderful uh, Armenian uh, sweet bread and, and handing it out as a gift. So I've been going door to door in the neighborhood uh, handing out uh, bread that my wife's been making. Enrica, what about you? Um, 
I have been cooking. I have been trying to figure out this um, this vegan gumbo situation. Mm. Um, I had a guest that actually requested it, and it was a challenge. So I wanted to make it as authentic as possible. And so I um, I found some really good uh, meat alternatives to put in it, but all of the veggies and the aromatics and the trinity, I just bumped that up. Mm-hmm. And I actually roasted um, the vegetables to give it kind of a an extra depth for um, the stock. And so I've, I've been playing around with that, and I have been eating a lot. I mean, I have my COVID sweater on to cover up my COVID pounds, but <laughs> I have been eating um, tamales and uh, lots of cheese. Yeah. <laughs> cheese is good. And ham and all of the things that... One should eat in small amounts. I have been eating in copious amounts. Well, so I brought for us today, since you mentioned cheese, um, I have already asked to be forgiven for <laughs> re-gifting. But, but I got this lovely gift of pimento cheese from Dr. Nancy Campbell. And when she is not practicing medicine, she is in the k- kitchen, and she is an amazing cook. But we were talking about gifts from the kitchen last week, and I just looked, and I thought, this is the perfect gift. It's in a, you know, uh, ball, uh, a little small mason jar, and homemade pimento cheese, which is delicious. But, you know, that says Merry Christmas to me. It does. It does. Yeah, and we we have lots of fun things on the table. We have sugar cookies, which... From Joe Sherman. Joe Sherman brought. We've got some sort of... uh, that's a, a cheese log. A cheese log. Mm. Yeah, a cheese log from uh, Joe Sherman also. Well, Joe, we thank you. Uh, also, Carol brought gifts uh, to Enrica and I and, yes. and Java. I got Fat Mama's Fire and Ice Pickles from Natchez. I got the Grumpy Man <laughs> Candied Jalapenos. Do you think mm. there could be any reason for that? From <laughs> Purvis, Mississippi. Are you talking about your husband? Your, no. your, <laughs> is it the grumpy man? <laughs> <laughs> and finally, the grumpy man got Benton's <laughs> Smoky Mountain Country Hams. I got country bacon mm-hmm. from Madisonville, Tennessee. Well, from and Benton's. Enrica and uh, Joy, Java, Joy, Joy yeah, is all I can say. Enrica and Java got, the, uh, got Benton's bacon, too. Mm. And what a treat from Madison, yes. Tennessee. Now on menus all over the world, yes. they don't put bacon. They put Benton's, Benton's bacon. Yes, they do. And um, we love Alan Benton. And this the bacon is it's cured with salt and brown sugar, and it's aged for 10 days. And the smoke flavor of this bacon is amazing. Uh, they smoke it with almost burnt hickory wood. Mm-hmm. In, in small wood burning Wait, stoves. All, all wood is burnt when it is used. I know, to, but I think they start it. They, <laughs> they, they take it down. They char it and then burn they, it? Or, no, but they take it down. Oh, okay. They don't right. just, um, yeah, they don't, they don't just put the wood on the fire. So there you go. And Enrique, well, thank you, you. you've got some karma sauce. I in saw yours. that. Yeah. Now, what about over here, the blood orange? Uh, marmalade. What we have here? That is what my partner sent to your wife. Oh, that's right. And this is from Sarah Beth, uh, Sarah Beth's Kitchen in New York. And, you know, she's real famous and puts out lots of jams and jellies now. But I remember her first market. She had just started her little kitchen on Amsterdam Avenue in New York. And she won first place for her orange apricot marmalade. This must be 20 years ago and it's so wonderful to p- see people succeed like that from a small cottage industry absolutely like our own april mcgregor yeah who, so uh, has um succeeded. so um on cooking and coping uh one of our friends uh grace ford posted a photo of 20 chicken pot pies now there is giving the gift Enrica. of christmas Yes. I love chicken pot pie. Yeah. But, you know, that's, she said she started with a small list a few years ago. Now mm-hmm. it's grown to 23. And she had, I mean, that's They're really a gift of love. It is, yeah. Do you, Enrica, do you give uh, food I do. for gifts? I, uh, I do. Prepared um, food? I do. I, um, I have started um, unintentionally 
with uh, lemon icebox pies. And it started Ooh. out. Oh, now that's one of Malcolm's yeah, very I started favorite. out doing those as just like for friends okay. and family. And when I would do small caterings, I would offer that as a dessert. And so that kind of took on um, a life of its own at the height of COVID. I think people were looking for like comfort. Yes. And they wanted something to just be soothing and, you know, sweet. And I, so I do that. And then I also like to make soups and yes. dips and, and something, I think, to kind of like help people with their entertaining. So pimento cheese and um, like cheese logs and stuff reminds me of things that we learned. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm about to date myself. <clears throat> Excuse me. When I was in high school and we had home economics and we would learn like dishes and things to make for the holidays. And so I've been kind of like going back to um, old cookbooks and wanting to make old-fashioned recipes. I am not a great baker, mm. and mm-hmm. so I kind of steer away from, like, cookie swaps and stuff. I'll do more dips, soups, uh, casseroles, mm-hmm. things that you could pop into the oven. Well, I have an idea for you. Um, Malcolm's birthday is March Third, mm-hmm. you might want to put that <laughs> okay. in your calendar. Let me, let me put that in yeah. my calendar. But Malcolm loves lemon ice box pie, and when I was living and working in Greenwood and coming back to home to Jackson on the weekends, mm-hmm. he would call me to see if I could bring a lemon ice box pie for him from Mockingbird Bakery in Greenwood. Martha Foose. Martha mm-hmm. Foose, and many of those <laughs> rode down the road. <laughs> so. I love a lemon. If you're looking for something to give him for his birthday, that's it. Okay. So if you're just joining us, Deep South Dining is talking about giving food the ultimate gift of love for Christmas as opposed to uh, uh, a a, a traditional gift, making pimento cheese, putting it in a nice jar with a ribbon, making cookies, giving bacon, making gumbos or soups. Giving bacon, yeah. Or pies. I know that that Java has had contact with this person, this uh, listener who's on cooking and coping, Charlie Reeves from Lena, Mississippi. Do you remember Charlie? Yeah, Charlie. He actually, I remember if he won our Duke's mayonnaise competition like a year ago. Oh, yeah, wow. he's he's such a great guy. Good memory. Um, but he sent out an article this week on cooking and coping, our Facebook site. And it was from a website. It was called treehugger.com. And treehugger.com is a promotes sustainable and eco-friendly lifestyle. But the name of the article is Scruffy Hospitality. <laughs> and hmm. I really love the name of that. And I appreciate that he sent it out. But it's about what we're talking about at Christmas. It's, you don't have to have your house fancy. You don't have to... You know, clean up and do all this, that scruffy hospitality where, you know, people just hang out in your kitchen Mm -hmm. and you're always ready and welcoming guests. So what do you think about that idea? I think it's fantastic. I also think that giving uh, a gift certificate or a gift card for a local restaurant Mm -hmm. is a fabulous idea. And if we look in our email, we've all just received one from our producer Java Chapman just sent out a nice Christmas cheer from a local owned food and beverage operation. And Java, I have to say, this is from Urban Foxes, and maybe it's since I've been living out in the country, but I know Malcolm and Enrica are jumping up and down. But um, tell, tell us about yeah, Urban I thought, Foxes I thought and thought where it is. I thought maybe two out of the three uh, people here would have been to Urban Foxes uh, this morning because I know Malcolm and Enrica are, you know, Subscribers to this uh, establishment. <laughs> but where? What was you? What's the the title of the neighborhood? Because it's in Bellhaven, correct? Bellhaven Heights. Mm-hmm. Heights in yeah, the Heights. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it runs parallel to State Street. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, the street that they're on. And they're on North Street. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's a like beautiful street, place. It's like right before you get to High Street for. Um, the farmer's market. So it's right. like right off of that. Okay, street. I yeah. got it. Yeah. Okay. And they, mm-hmm. they, they have wonderful coffees and, and pastries and uh, what did you say, Enrique? Sausage rolls? The sausage rolls. The sausage rolls. Yes. And they often uh, are a music venue too. They mm-hmm. hold different events. So Urban Fox, this is just a, one of the cool places here in Jackson. And we've talked about supporting local as a great gift because it's kind of like a double you you know give a good gift to some great people Mm -hmm. but you also support a local establishment yes um 
And so um, that's one of the beauties of gift giving. It does not have to be necessarily a wrapped up package from the mall. It could be some gumbo. And, you know, Enrique, when you were talking about your gumbo, you were talking about the vegan gumbo. Mm -hmm. You're not talking about the uh, green gumbo. of New No, Does, I, is it gumbo zerb. Zerb. Yeah, that's, that, that's not with, that. Not that. I w I've actually made um, in, um, I made a, an andouille in chicken gumbo and so in place of the andouille I found a, a plant based sausage and um, the chicken I've used um, jackfruit and then I also used uh, this um, chicken stuff I'm sorry vegans I don't know the actual name of it it wasn't it's like an actual cooked and then it looks like chicken pieces oh, okay and so I've used that but I preferred with the jackfruit just because um, I can season and roast the jackfruit to give it like the taste of chicken um, and it's I think it's a little healthier than using some of the processed uh, vegan um, plant-based items. One of my favorite things that that you do is one time you did a, a dish, and I can't remember what the protein was, but with uh, gumbo herb, uh, gum, I guess you called it gumbo herbs, it was like, you know, the salt, the all of the trinity, and you use that as a condiment or, you know, underneath oh, the protein. Mm -hmm, protein. Mm -hmm. And you had a container left and gave it to me. Mm -hmm. And I used those were the most delicious. Th I used them as a condiment for just about everything. Oh, I'm glad mm -hmm. to hear that. Yeah. That's terrific. Okay, it's time for our first break today. We appreciate you tuning in to Deep South Dining. Today, Carol, Enrica Williams, and I are gathered around the table. There's lots of snacks. We have pimento cheese. And we I have think sugar we'll cookies. eat some on the break. <laughs> on the break, we're, I'd eat this bacon if it weren't raw. Well, I guess it's not raw. It's smoked. But when we come back, we will talk to our great friend Robert St. John, a real champion of Mississippi and Mississippi food, as always. He's on the move. He's very busy. We hope that he can bring us up to speed on all of his 2021 projects, what's going on in his kitchen for Christmas. So we ask you to stay tuned. For people who love food, there's no time of year like the holidays and no place on earth quite like Mississippi where a melting pot of culinary talent blends the flavors of yesterday and today. Sweet, smoky, and savory seasonal flavors that will satisfy your spirits. Wherever you choose to wander, Mississippi. Wanderers welcome. And we want to welcome Robert St. John to the show. We appreciate you joining us this morning. And we just listened to your voiceover for the Wanderers Welcome Visit Mississippi ad campaign. And, of course, you and I know that you were also the voiceover of a whole complete um, campaign that we had back in my day as the director of tourism. So it is great to see that you're back voicing that. Yeah, um, and uh, I'm about to stop wandering here for a little bit, too. <laughs> Today's my last uh, wander uh, event before uh, Christmas, so I'm ready to kind of hunker down and, and do my day job and uh, just just run a few restaurants. But, yeah, thank yeah, you for... You're headed to Meridian today, right? I am. I'm going to Cater's Market. Uh, Jamie Cater has a... Has a she's got a store in... Um, uh, Meridian and one in Starkville, and it's a lot like your original Everyday Gourmet, Carol. That uh, you know, it's a it's a gift shop and uh, and and cooking stuff. Uh, she serves uh, food as well. I, she's probably more of a restaurant these days than she is anything else. But she has really really good chicken salad. Some of it is really my favorite chicken salad in the state of Mississippi. I used to say it reminds me of my grandmother, but I guess my grandmother's been good, gone long enough to I can say it's really a little better than my grandmother's. It's, yeah, you can. It's not easy to say that, but uh, it's a true statement either way. Robert, you, you have been so busy, and I know the documentary on Walter Anderson premiered. I can't remember. Was it November or, or was November it November 4th month? was the – and then, then, then you all ran that. I think it was like five, five – uh, showings the first week which was really nice well i 
I hid it changing. I guess we were watching something on PBS, and, and it and it came on. I mean, I, I had mm-hmm. had it on my list to do, but we were just absolutely spellbound. And I remember it at the end of it, just texting you and saying, "Robert, this is a gift. Yeah. You know, it's a well. gift." to all of us it's it's a gift to art everywhere and it was really one of the most beautiful well done documentaries you're sweet carol thank you and i'm, I'm going to tell you it's something i'm really proud of i texted anthony thaxton who really is uh he's he's 90 percent of that documentary uh i was i'm a producer and and helped and and did stuff along the way but but he he deserves the overwhelming majority of the credit there but i told him the other day i said one of the most important things i think of outside of extra table you know and raising my kids and providing some some jobs for people it's it's one of the most important things i've ever done so much so that we are uh forming a production company that will continue to showcase uh, notable mississippians in this manner with documentaries and most will have a, a companion book uh, like this book that's just come out uh, on on Anderson. That's kind of the companion piece to the documentary. But we've got a list of as we've been on the road for the past two weeks with the book signing tour. We've got a list of people we really want to just tee up. And the guidepost I kept telling Anthony as we were working on this. It was a three year. Um, deal there from conception to you know airing and i kept telling him what we need and and we told the family this down in ocean springs walter anderson's family all four kids are still alive we told them that we want people in portland oregon and people in portland maine who may have never heard of walter anderson and this genius talented man to to know of his art and his life and his work and and so there are a lot of other Mississippians like that that we want to showcase and um, and do. So we're we're working working with uh, the folks up at MPB, and we've got a a company that that works to get uh, these things placed on other PBS stations. And it's my hope that by the end of 2022, we can get on a you know a, a few hundred other PBS stations across the nation. We're working towards that right now. Well, that's the Walter Anderson Project documentary and book, and you are right. on the road signing the book with Anthony, and so that's been a great holiday success. I am certain I have seen awful lot on social media. But another project you mentioned that I saw another social media post about uh, is, is your work with Extra Table, and you just scored a hundred twenty grand um, donation from your church. I know it's a church near no, you. No, it's uh, it's actually Christ Methodist in in uh, Jackson. Okay. Out there on Old Ken near the Country Club, right. be, I think they're the largest congregation in the state, and it is a hundred and twenty thousand dollar goal. Goal. I had to, okay. I had to reword that. Uh, they they believe they're going to collect it before Christmas. So we uh, the yesterday was the launch, mm-hmm. and uh, what that started uh, that campaign. I mean, Extra Table is just on fire right now. Martha Allen, who's the executive director there has just done amazing things. She's a she's a force of nature. Yeah, well um, Robert, I, I'm I'm remembering back to when you your idea, your original idea from yeah. uh, for Extra Table and I can't remember when that was. Two thousand nine I got a phone call, uh Edward Street Fellowship Center here in Hattiesburg was feeding about, I don't know, eight hundred families a month and they had completely run out of food. They called and asked if I would help, and that's kind of how it started. Uh, I got the idea, and I kind of fleshed it out. And to be honest with you, I really thought, you know, I was skeptical there was even a hunger problem in Mississippi. I, you know, I'm thinking, well, this is America. Surely, you know, people aren't, aren't really, you know, food insecure like the government says. And so I kind of went on a, a self-discovery mission. <laughs> I learned pretty quick there's a huge problem. And uh, and so we have, you know, I formed a, a 501c3 nonprofit, and uh, we we based it on two founding principles. Number one, a hundred percent of the money we raise for food will go to purchase food. A hundred percent. Not I didn't, you know, there are a lot of charities out there, and 
you know, 70% go to salaries and all this kind of, I was like, I don't want to be a part of anything that comes anywhere close to that kind of situation. So we're going to do 100%. And so we formed a whole other 501c3 that does nothing but take care of the administrative costs. And we have two separate boards, and uh, we, we've run that thing. The, the model has grown over the years to the point we, we partnered with a group uh, here in Hattiesburg called Child Purchasing. And they're a purchasing collective for restaurants, mostly in Louisiana and Mississippi. Uh, two guys uh, named Justin and Michael, and they do a great job. And what they have made possible for Extra Table, we... We were always buying wholesale, but now we buy basically below wholesale. We're dry, buying tractor trailer loads of canned tuna, tractor trailer loads of um, you know pasta and pasta sauce and it things that these pantries want and it's healthy food. And that's the other thing. It's always going to be 100% of the money we raise for food goes to food. Number two, it's going to be healthy food. So we're fighting hunger and obesity at the same time. But we get our food shipped to us free. We get it warehoused for free. And then we get it delivered to the agencies for free. It's uh, it's very uh, – we just purchased the food below wholesale, and it's taken care of. After that, we're in over – 50 uh, agencies across the state right now. I think that's going up to 55 in 2022. We cover the entire state uh, in these agencies, and it's um, it's a really interesting thing. I was telling them I spoke at that church yesterday. It's a great church, and I and I told the congregation that you know when we approach um, a food agency, you know, say in Corinth or somewhere, we we typically go in. You know, they're we use uh, Feeding America as the clearinghouse to make sure everything's legit and above board before we send them food. And we go in and say, hey, we're extra table. We want to start sending you food. And they're, they're always skeptical at that first. Oh, well, how much is it going to cost us? And we said, well, it's not going to cost you anything. We just want to ship you food. And, and, and they, well, do you want our donor list? No, but don't want it your donor list. We're going to raise money, and we're going to ship you food at no cost to you. And and so they're still a little skeptical until they get the first delivery, and then we put them on a schedule every month. And, you know, everybody's thinking about hunger issues this time of year between Thanksgiving and Christmas. But kids in Mississippi, the 200,000-plus kids who typically get a school breakfast and a school lunch and then don't eat again until the next day, you know, they're hungry, just as hungry in July, if not more so, because school's out. Oh, wow. That sounds amazing. Hi, Robert. This is Enrica. And hey, there. I wanted to ask you, um, how can people give to um, what you just spoke of? What are some ways or some things that people could do to help? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. So there, there are several things. Uh, number one, the, the first and easiest, and if uh, people are listening, I know... A lot of people this time of year, their accountants are telling them, you know, you need to, you got this much, you need to, if they've had a good year, hopefully, you know, you need to find a, a nonprofit or a charity to send this money to to help on your taxes. We'd love to be that charity. Uh, you can you can look us up at extratable.org, E-X-T-R-A table.org. Um, but there are also all sorts of other things we do. Uh, we as I said, we cover the state. Uh, we partner with a lot of different people. We have a program uh, that's called This Box Feeds People, where we bring boxes in to different uh, businesses, different uh, church organizations, and um, people. There's a there's a little shopping list in there, and people you know people can teach their kids you know about hunger issues. It's got some facts on there, and uh, it it gives you kind of a shopping list on what you need, you know, uh, low-fat proteins, uh, low-sugar fruits, healthy grains, things like that that we can get to people in need and stack. I pay, We had eight, uh, this church yesterday, uh, Christ Methodist, uh, God bless them, had 800 boxes uh, packed with food. So that's another 3,200 full meals. But if they hit their $120,000 goal that is 750,000 wow. meals 
through extra tables. So we're we're at a point now to where every one dollar uh, we can purchase because of our buying power and everything about five point nine healthy meals. Um, uh, you know, when when you first started, it, it's it's crazy. I guess I'm uh, about thirteen years into this, or twelve, or something like that. You know, early on, it was almost one dollar buys one meal because you, you know we're just getting started. It's very very hard. Mm-hmm. To start a nonprofit from scratch and grow the thing, and and what I've learned is that you have a you have a growth uh, line that's just moves steady, steady, steady up, and then you hit a point to where it just you know peaks and sky, and that's that's where we are. Our uh, you know we about two two and a half years ago. Well, I'll just tell you during COVID that full year, our last full year of uh, existence with Extra Table, we ship 5.9 million pounds wow. of food to agencies all over Mississippi. And we talk in pounds, but that's, that's just how these agencies start. It's not, it's not the really the best way to describe because a lot of times it's million pounds of, you know, food that is not healthy. All our food, uh, you know, Mississippi is number one in food insecurity, but mm-hmm. we're also number one in obesity. And so we're we're battling that uh, that fight on on both fronts. And I had a problem reconciling that when I was first getting into this thing because I thought, well, how can we be number one in food insecurity, but also number one in this? Somebody's eating something somewhere, right? <laughs> and and what I learned quickly is that those two always go hand in hand, always, because people who don't have enough money to lead a proper diet are basically living out of convenience stores, mm-hmm. drinking the cheapest mm-hmm. drinks filled with sugar mm-hmm. and the cheapest snack foods. I mean, that's that's supper for some people. Right. You know, my my, my, uh, my dad died when I was six, and my mom raised my brother and me up on our own and on an art teacher's salary. I mean, we didn't have any money, but we never missed a meal. And so it was, it was really hard for me to comprehend that this was going on out there. But there are over 600. We only have 2.9 million citizens in the entire state and 600,000 20 percent are food insecure 125,000 of those are senior citizens it's a real thing and over 200,000 are kids Mm -hmm. and so it's 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 a problem robert we appreciate the work you do we thank you for joining us this morning you'd be safe heading to meridian now Uh, well i'll eat some chicken salad for you mal (laughs) do that and uh, we'll talk a little bit about your christmas morning casserole in your absence but but be safe and (laughs) thanks for joining us hey y'all y'all are the best take care keep doing what you're doing thanks Thanks, robert bye-bye all right, we got a caller on the phone, someone who's very familiar to this show. He's our buddy. He sent us food this morning. Carol, what else can you say about Joe Sherman? I really can't say much because I'm eating the Christmas cookies that <laughs> Joe Sherman made. And Joe is one of our favorite guest hosts and one of the real inspirations in cooking and coping. So good morning, Joe. Good morning. How are y'all this morning? Oh, we're good. We're just sitting yeah. around here eating and uh, talking about eating. Uh, so it's a beautiful thing. Here so did MPB. you make these cookies? <laughs> well, yeah, so so the cookies, the two things I brought to the studio this morning are two of the memories and two of the traditions that we continue. I made Christmas cookies with my mother when I was a little boy. And she'd always take the leftover dough that wasn't big enough to make a cookie and made me a big cookie. But So we made cookies. We iced them with confectionate sugar and milk, and we put non-parels on them, which are basically a little bitty colored dots, you know, candy. And so we made them, and then when, then when uh, we, Mary Pry and I got married, we made them. And then we had a son. He and I made them. Then his friends and I made them. And then when he got married, his wife and I made them. And Mary Pryor and he was a creative directors I, really they were just telling you what you were doing wrong and then uh, then i started making with my grandchildren but along the way i found campbell's cookies and i always had uh, I, I was always using my mother's recipe then i moved to great grandmother Dodie's sugar cookie page 287 on southern side boards i used her recipe Page 287, you heard it here. Page 287. I memorized it. I got a new recipe about three years ago, and it mimics the Campbell's cookie or tea cake better than anything. So I make them them every year. Uh, It's kind of my Christmas therapy. 
uh, and uh, yeah, I made those. We had we resurrected the Bellwood Drive Christmas party next night, and so people living in your old house, Carol, came down, and Mona Nicholas kind of put it all together. So we had a Christmas party. We served those cookies, and then one of the other traditions is the the cheese roll. That and I if brought. you can hear a crunch, <clears throat> the crunch is in Rico. <laughs> With the saltine and the cheese roll. So, so oh, Joe, Carol, tell us, Carol, tell us about it. Carol brought the cookies over to her side of the table. Enrique <laughs> and I have <laughs> focused <laughs> on the cheese ball or roll. So <laughs> get, t- and tell us about is that, I have oh, is that paprika is. on the outside? Mm. Yeah, that's paprika. So the cheese roll. So we, uh, John and Louise Hartline, they're from the Mississippi Delta, and I gave John a cheese roll. He took it home. His wife Louise ate some of it, and she sends Mary Pryor a text. This is my mama's recipe. Well, she's from the Delta. Mary Pryor's mother got this recipe from Mary Pryor's aunt in Greenwood. Okay? And then uh, the new rector at St. James, Elizabeth Wheatley Jones, she posted a picture on Facebook, and she had one in her picture. She had the same cheese roll. (laughs) Okay, Chef and Rico, what do you think? It's really good. It is... um, (laughs) yeah, I've had like two, um, <laughs> what is it, uh, just like two smother, smatterings on, on these saltine crackers. It is really, really good. I have, um, I was just telling um, Malcolm and um, Carol that I remember making like cheese logs and we would do like dried parsley and pecans mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. stuff to make like for entertaining. So I just always find uh, a warmth and an appreciation for nostalgic snacks. Well, yeah, well this one has a this one has a good. lot of history. Yeah, a lot of history, and and it's got some. Uh, what everybody talks about every year, at least they used to. The recipe consists of like uh, Cracker Barrel, ten ounces of mm-hmm. extra sharp cheese, one jar of Kraft Old English cheese. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It used to be one jar of Nippy cheese, but they don't make it anymore, and uh, garlic cheese. Wow. That they don't make anymore. Mm-hmm. So you had to add lib and uh, add garlic, cream cheese, and a little Velveeta, about eight ounces of Velveeta, and garlic, and then Lee and Parents, Tabasco, and Italian pepper to taste. But, you know, some people like it hotter than others, but that has been a tradition that we've just carried on and on and on. And it is, uh, Mary Pride does it, she does a great job. We've given them as gifts. And, you know, it's, as you said, it's, it, you know, it's, it, it's a real warm gift. It's uh, warming to the cust to the customer. To the, to <laughs> Java the Chapman <laughs> has left the booth. Java Chapman what? has left the booth. He has <laughs> now made his way from his workstation to hit the cheese ball. It's worth it. Pandemonium it is, has, has absolutely hit the worth Pandemonium. it. Pandemonium, our later, our yes, later is, it is worth it. Yes, we've made we've made two we've made two re- she made two recipes uh, this this Christmas which we hardly ever do, uh, and it's the paprika is kind of like mm. some people say they think that's the secret. I don't know if it's the secret or not, but it's, it's fun. You know, we used to do she used to take great this stuff up and mix it by hand. One day mm. I came up with this great idea: why don't we use a dough hook? Mm. So we use the dough hook, and man, you talking about cut the time in half. It's been great. <laughs> hey, Joe, if you would send that recipe yes. to Java or send it to me, we'll get it posted uh, okay. for people. You know, All right. so so people can enjoy what we're doing. Your job yeah, is still, if they try to job decon- is speechless. If they try to deconstruct uh, what Joe brought up here, it's, it's not going to be anything. It's not going to uh, be anything. It's not going to be anything no. to break down. Right. No, no. <laughs> but if you're listening, we would appreciate uh, if you would give us a call so that we can continue eating. Uh, so we we have a caller uh, from Mobile. Mikey's on the phone. Uh, what's going on, Mike? You're asking about the jackfruit, I believe. Yes, but I also would like to ask another, a, a more minor question, and that is, is this too tacky, even for me? <laughs> um, I have made, I have used my my family's citrus trees. I hated to see the rinds being wasted. So I made a whole, I got a couple of gallons of um, concentrated um, satsuma peel vinegar. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> is that too tacky yes. to give? That I mean, for a, cleaning, even. Yeah, I love satsumas, and I like citrus 
anyway, like blood oranges, um, Meyer lemons, especially the zest, uh, the rind. You can use something with that and then the juice. And then you can even take the rinds and dehydrate those. And you can make a variation of like a lemon pepper. You can make a satsuma pepper and you can put like black pepper. You can use some um, garlic and some onion and some coriander and you can make a really beautiful spice rub with that. So in Satsumas is just such a lovely citrus. Um I would put that one blood orange is my favorite and then Satsumas and then going into mandarins. So it's definitely um it's definitely the, not tacky at all. <laughs> may, may I say that the thing about the Satsuma peels is mm-hmm. that they're not there's not so much rag in them, you yeah. know, like there isn't oranges and lemons yes. and stuff. So you really don't have to do that extra bunch of steps. Right. I'm, you know, I'm all about, you know, doing it as, I guess, lazily as possible. Efficiently. Um, it's efi- <laughs> right. It's efficient. And then also, too, you can take your, your satsuma and you can preserve those, like how you would do a Meyer lemon with um, with salt and sugar. And you maybe could put a little bit of turmeric. I, like to, I always like to use turmeric and coriander when I... Uh, when I preserve uh, Meyer lemons and Satsumas would do beautifully with that just because of the thin skin that they have. And then the meat inside, you could use that and dice that up and make a relish or make it uh, puree it with a vinaigrette. Um, it's a lot that you can do with that. So, And in regard to, um, you had a question about jackfruit. What was what was your yeah, question about you jackfruit? You mentioned it before. Uh, using yes. Where do you find it and, and uh, what? Can you what can you do besides roast with it? Please? So so a jackfruit, it's a tropical fruit. It is quite sizable. It's, I say it's like the size of a, a newborn. Like it's really bumpy, and it's like a light green color. Um, I think. Well, I'm here in Jackson, Mississippi, and so I've seen them in whole the whole part at uh, Mr. Chen's. Um, Oriental Market on I-55. Um, but typically, if I'm looking for jackfruit, believe it or not, um, our um, local stores, Kroger, um, Walmart, uh, any type of grocery store, you can find jackfruit in the freezer section. You can find it also in the can. And the thing about the one that's in the can, they'll have some that has been sweetened like you would find on the fruit section, like a like a fruit cocktail. If you're looking for something sweeter, you want to do uh, a smoothie or something fruit-related with it, I would suggest using that one. But they also have one that is, um, it's like in a brine, and that is the one, and, and jackfruit is an amazing fruit. The fiber of it, it takes on the texture of of any type of meat, any type of protein. So if you want the pulled pork um, taste, and the flavor and the texture, you season it like pulled pork. It holds up like that. And so um, when I use jackfruit and gumbo, I use it like, because I typically use dark chicken, dark meat chicken in, in gumbo. So I just pull it apart like I would do if I was to have shredded chicken. And it and I just season it like I would season chicken and roast it to kind of give it a little bit of crispiness. And I just add it into the gumbo. So. Mikey, thank you so much for listening and calling. We also have another caller on the phone. TJ is calling in from Kosciuszko about a family Christmas Eve tradition. Hello, TJ. Yeah, how y'all? I love the show. (laughs) Yeah. We have, uh, on Christmas Eve, my family has done this since I was a little boy, and my brother does it now. Thank goodness he learned how to do it. But we have boiled custard. Mm. Oh. Oh, Yeah, now you got us attention. And and uh, you give it to the kids before they go to bed, hot ball custard, mm. and they will go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you want to tell us what you put yeah, in the hot please. ball custard? <laughs> yes, I'm intrigued. Well, it, yeah, I don't know. My brother cooks it. My mother oh, cooks okay. it. He learned how to cook it. and uh, He cooks it Eggs every Christmas and milk day. and a lot of sugar and some vanilla. Yep. Oh, okay. That's right, and it's boiled custard. And you eat it while it's hot. You drink it in the cup while it's hot. And oh, okay. To the kids, and they will go to sleep. Hot custard. Okay. Mm, that sounds great. It does. It's like a it's like an eggnog. Uh-huh. But yeah, 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 uh-huh. yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that's great. Thank Thanks you for, for sharing calling that. and listening and sharing. We appreciate you, TJ. Always good to hear from you, Joe. You got a uh, particular family uh, Christmas or Christmas Eve dish that you like to feature? 
Well, you know, uh, he was talking about custard. Uh, Mary Pryor makes her mother's either Charlotte Russe or uh, eggnog, and it's so thick. Uh, you can uh, eat it with a spoon, and you will go to sleep because it definitely has bourbon in it. Right now. I'm, not, I'm not going to dance around the fact that we will put a little bourbon in the eggnog. Okay? Yeah. So, but I, you know, our fan, I, you know, I, we were trying. My sister and I were trying to think of, you know, we always had, and I know the listeners are probably tired of hearing about it. We always had traditional Lebanese food for our our uh, our uh, Christmas dinner. And then Mary Pryor's family always had brunch, and we always had shad roe. Mm. I don't know if you've ever had shad roe, but it is phenomenal cooked in Worcester and butter in a cast iron skillet on the stove. But you can't find it anymore. Mm. Uh, used to get it at Central Grocery, but now they don't have it. Uh, they're not in season right now. So, But it mm. was a delicacy, something I never heard of, uh, right. you know. Uh, I'm they're eating shad roe and I'm eating raw kippy, so it's kind of you know <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense. I didn't understand. So, Joe, uh, thank you so much for the treats and Merry Christmas to you and Mary Pryor and keep well, same posting those pictures and bring well, us more well, food. As I was saying, <laughs> well, this is one of the yeah, we'll bring you more food. I, I, have to get you some, I want you to get you some of the cookies, the Mary Pryor's cheese roll before uh, we signed off for Christmas. So y'all have a wonderful Christmas with your families and. Uh, stay safe and uh, look forward to a great uh, 2022. Okay, Amen, brother. All right. Hey, All right. guess who's on the phone? Uh, I'm going to guess just sort of blindly. April McGregor. From Philly, PA, <laughs> not Philly, MS. <laughs> Hello, April. What's going on? Hi. Merry Christmas. Thank you all for having me on today. Absolutely. I love hearing um, the, the memories. It's great. <laughs> What's cooking uh, at the McGregor Philly uh, kitchen yeah. this time of year. Um, lots of cookies, a little bit of candy. My family was always huge candy makers. That was probably our biggest um, Christmas <clears throat> tradition for making making a lot of different candies. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, I do a little bit of that, and actually went to a cookie swap yesterday, which was awesome because. It's just three of us in our household, so I really can't afford to make a batch of everything. Um, so it's nice to be able to make a few things and then swap with others to get a lot of variety, and that's awesome. That's awesome. Hey, when you're making candy, do you perchance make divinity? I do. Well, Java has never had divinity, Neither so have ne- I. oh, in, yeah. Enrica. So next year, if you would keep them on your Christmas list, and there was a oh, post on absolutely. cooking and coping. Someone literally asking if anybody made Divinity, they would buy it because they needed oh, it. Oh, I saw that. What about that? I, I mean, that. it's you, become a I, rarity. I would totally. I, oh, it, it completely is. I mean, no one makes it anymore. But um, it's also very few people eat it anymore. A lot of people find, think that it's too sweet or that they don't really wrong, understand. Wrong, wrong, wrong. You know, the, yeah, but, exactly. But, so April, could you, gotta, you describe it? Old time You know, Java yeah. asked Mal asked us to describe it, and we just didn't do so. Yeah, you know, tell us kind of okay. how you make it. And Enrica's well, ro- rolling her eyes. She wants to know. Inquiring minds. Okay. Absolutely. So, um, so the first thing that I would say about divinity is, is my you know my family always described it as like a white fudge. It's an egg white um, sugar. Um, concoction, you know, beaten to like the softball stage, and then and then you whip it and all this sort of stuff. Um, but it's really, you know, it's a little bit marshmallowy, a little mm. bit like a fudge minus the fat, you know, because it's egg white. So there's not fat in it. So it's very fluffy little clouds that melt in your mouth. And it's to, for my family, it's all about the pecan. Mm-hmm. I was thinking um, yesterday if I had to distill Christmas down to one singular flavor, it would be pecans. For mm. months, my grandfather would sit in his recliner and crack all the pecans that he gathered from his old um, family home place, and, and everything just featured pecans at Christmas, you know. You and Whether me it's both. candies and, yeah, candies and cookies, and it's just pecans, 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 pecans. Uh, but divinity is all about the pecans. The pecans have that little bit of bitterness to them that just contrasts so nicely to the very sweet um, egg white. And, and the other thing that I will say about pecans is that you really just cannot buy them in stores, like on the commercial market, and they taste anything the way that the fresh-shelled or the unpasteurized stuff 
um, taste when you can, you know, get it from someone who has, like, pecan trees or, like, directly from, like, a farm or something that's not treating them. Um, I think all nuts sold on the commercial market have to be pasteurized, and it really changes the flavor of them. It also changes the texture. Mm-hmm. I was yeah, I was doing absolutely. some roasted salted pecans. Like, mm-hmm. I did a vat of them yesterday, and I didn't have quite enough, so... I had to buy a few bags, you yes. know, two pound bags, and and it didn't absorb the liquid like mm. like the right. other ten pounds mm-hmm. I'd done. Right. I mean, I think because they've gone through this pasteurization process and it sort of like seals the outside of them in a way, and they're yeah, they're they're very different. I don't really know all the ways to describe it, but um, you just can't beat the real thing. Oh, but back to divinity. So it's all about you know my. I would say the most romantic thing about my grandparents, and these are not people that I often describe as that romantic, but but making the divinity, my, my grandmother never had a stand mixer or anything, and every Christmas they made divinity together, because uh-huh. it takes two people, if you don't have a, if you don't have a stand mixer, it takes two people. So one person to do the mixing and one person to pour in that boiling sugar syrup. What a sweet um, so note I always to loved end on. Like yeah, I've always loved how it was like it ha- they had to both be available to do it and all that sort of stuff. April, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to one and all. Deep South Dining is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting's Think Radio. We are funded by generous contributions from good folks just like you. Our show is produced by Java Chapman. For my co-host, Carol Puckett, our in-studio guest, Enrica Williams. For Robert St. John, Joe Sherman, April McGregor, we thank you all. Stay tuned for Now You're Talking. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download.